If you're tired of the standard business and marketing fundamentals, frameworks, and funnels, <laughs> you need a little mischief. Get ready to turn up the volume on the CEO Mischief Maker podcast, where you access conversations with seasoned business owners who have smashed through mindset barriers, innovated the standard boring business and marketing playbooks, and executed future-paced strategies with bleeding edge tools and tactics to micro fail their way into massive success and growth. We are Mindset Impact Strategic Catalysts, helping innovative entrepreneurs focus. We are CEO Mischief Makers. Ready to make a little mischief? Hey, hey, CEO Mischief Makers, here we go. Uh, Michael Strong joins me again for our last conversation. I don't think it'll be my last conversation, but uh, it will be the last conversation of this podcast episode. So um, welcome back to the conversation. And if you haven't listened to the first two episodes, you need to go back and listen to those because now we get to my favorite part. Well, I might I have all of them are favorites. I feel like I'm judging my children based on each of my, uh, each of the different episodes that I do. But really, this is the part you can use as an entrepreneur, as a parent, as a student, if you're listening to this. This is the part you can actually, the rubber meets the road. You're getting into the weeds. You're going, what can I actually do? So I'm just going to shut up and say, what do we do? How do you, how do you actually implement an education like you've been talking about the last two episodes? Well, thank you. And first, of course, I have helped many people start schools. And so I'm happy to help other people start schools. I'm. This is my mission in life is to uh, change culture. Again, 8 billion people waking up and joyfully creative and helping each other live better lives. So uh, I'm going to go through kind of a week because uh, we have a weekly cycle. Um, and really, the big thing is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday are structured the same. Wednesday is different for electives, but that's an important difference. So our core classes, we have two core classes. I'm in Austin Central Time, so I'll be concrete and think of how we do it, Austin Central Time, um, from 10 to 12 and then from one to three. So kind of two two-hour blocks, four hours, that's the essence of our day. And then I'll add bells and whistles in a minute. Um, the two-hour Socratic Humanities block, everything is 15 to one in Zoom. When I did this in person, brick and mortar, roughly 15 to one as well, but we get to sit around a table. Um, and the first part is personal growth. So for the first hour, the guide will ask a question, how do we learn from our mistakes? How do we set goals? How do we deal with anger? How do we become better at who we want to be? All kinds of things. And the students have a conversation. And it takes a little while to build trust. You know, not a great class on day one. They have to learn to trust each other. But once they feel safe, then we get to the point where we have remarkable conversations and gradually students internalize how to become a better person as they see it. We're not telling them what to do, but they're, they all want to have good lives. They all want to have good lives. And so we're focused on how do we help you have a better life? long-term, not video games this Saturday or whatever, long-term. How do we help you have a better life? <laughs> then the next hour is uh, Socratic Communities proper, where we read a difficult text, classics from around the world. So European, Asian, some African, Muslim, you know, different classics from different cultures. Um, and we use difficult texts. So part of what we do, I mentioned earlier, is that because the prose is difficult to understand, often philosophy and poetry are great because they're really hard to understand, we have to do some real teamwork to make sense of this. So it's not just debate. We do out of the text conversations about how it applies to life and those can get lively and fiery. We also go in the text and slow it down to be very analytical and thoughtful. And I think that is a gas pedal and a brake. When things are getting a little bit too slow and academic, we ask questions that pull out of the text. Oh, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in Plato, there's, would you bring your friend to uh, justice if he had committed a crime? And it sounds kind of abstract and we can make it very real. Suppose you had a friend who is a drunk driver, would you tell on him? Whoa, you know, and so we make it very real, but then if it becomes too lively and they're, you know, too all over the place, okay, break, let's go back and look at the text. Exactly what does this sentence say? And there's an artistry in leading these, but over time they become really good at highly intellectual text-based conversations that are also passionate. This is how we get the SAT verbal gains. Yeah. If you're reading difficult material every day, 
you know, I could go on a whole side rant about how nobody reads anymore. Kids don't read. If they read, they read simple stuff. Nobody's reading hard prose. People think the SAT of verbal is, you know, memorizing vocabulary words. Hey, if you're not reading serious work until you're in 12th grade, of course you have to memorize vocabulary words. But if uh, you're talking about epistemology and, you know, uh, envy and things like this, you know, you'll, you'll get there. Um, so that's credit communities. We also include writing in that, typically once a week a writing session, uh, sometimes little writing ep episodes. Um, also, they get feedback on Google Docs, and then we have writing labs where they can go and get more writing. So uh, I am I write a lot. I always uh, say writing is 95% thinking. I think one huge problem in regular schools is uh, write on blah, blah, blah. The kids don't care. It's meaningless. Why? Yeah. What, what's what you're doing to me? But concrete example, we wrote, read two articles from Yale on should we bring the woolly mammoths back from extinction or not? Oh my gosh, very passionate. After arguing with your friends about that for an hour, um, you're ready to write, yeah, they should. Or, no, 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 they shouldn't. Whatever it is, you know, <laughs> and we can help them make an essay out of that. So getting that passion <laughs> is key. Um, and then an hour off for lunch and then STEM, we have both problem solving where we are, uh, do difficult mathematical problems, sometimes from brilliant.org, a wonderful resource. Um, we also use something called CSMP, game-like mathematic um, competitions. We have sometimes used math uh, problem competitions for math contests. And we get them to think collaboratively on how do we solve this hard problem? Georg Polya, a Hungarian mathematician, wrote a book, How to Solve It. He's an inspiration for our problem solving. And then in science, we really dig deep with examples from biology, chemistry, physics, astronomy, yada, yada, yada. We also do empirical modeling. We've got a whole strand in our science curriculum, which is using spreadsheets. Part of this is fluency in spreadsheets is a great skill. We get them to model all kinds of different things on spreadsheets, starting with very, very simple models to much more sophisticated uh, empirical models. That's a quick tour of our STEM curriculum. In addition to that, we have the standard linear math curriculum, sixth grade math, seventh grade math, eighth grade math, algebra one, geometry, algebra two, that we use math space, which is an adaptive math software program. And again, we have every student set their own goals. Some students are going to do two years of math in one year, other students half year. Um, if they need to go over the summer, we have students doing math all summer if they want. Um, you know, that way we let students go at the right pace for them. Um, we finally also have a purpose class every morning that I co-teach, where again, the intersection of what do you love? What are you good at? What does the world need? What will the world pay for? We discuss these questions in a thousand different ways to get kids focused on things. Then we shift to Wednesdays, electives. And on the electives, we have a combination of more traditional academics. Uh, we have US history, Spanish, finance, that kind of thing. We teach a lot of digital skills because all the kids with their creative and entrepreneurial projects are into the digital world. So we have software development, Python, audio engineering, video production, graphic design, um, UI UX, all these sorts of things where if the kids wanna do cool things online, they wanna learn and develop these skills. They really love this part of the program. And then finally, we have a relationship course, a calisthenics course, music course, more kind of whole person sorts of things. Um, and then finally, every student has a mentor who meets with them one-on-one -on -one once every two weeks and helps them figure out who they are and where they're going in life. The overall agency that we imply in students and the one-on-one -on -one mentoring leads to students who are much more in charge of their own education and life. And not just because we let them do whatever they want, we've developed a very thorough, well-designed structure. One other piece of that, and then I'll let you jump in. Um, I'm very big on the lifelong piece. So we have every student write an autobiography from the age of 100 every year so that they think about who they are and who they might become. When they're middle school, they're often kind of silly. I'm going to be a Nobel laureate, rock star, surgeon kind of thing, buckaroo bonsai. But as they grow older, they become very thoughtful and mature. And we also, uh, there's a wonderful um, graphic from Wait But Why on your life in weeks. And it shows exactly how many weeks you have. I think he goes up to the age of 90. And it gave him a concrete sense of, wow, we don't have that many weeks. And if you waste this week and another week and so forth, wow, life is short. Let's, let's value it. Wow. So first I need to ask you, so the kids don't start school until 10 a.m.? Exactly. I mean, the, my course is at 9.30, so if they take the purpose course, right, that's optional at 9.30, but yeah, 10 a.m. I, uh... I, I, I mean, that's the number one. So again, my older son is, uh, since he was a baby, he would take two, two and a half hour naps a day, right, up until he was like four. 
And yeah. even now he can easily sleep 10, 12 hours and he's 24. So yeah. sleep and then not getting up at 6 a.m. is uh, is yeah. his life's goal. <laughs> so yeah. and and to be able to do other things. So that's that was his biggest his biggest complaint of high school is he had to get up at the time when most teenagers need sleep to do the growing that they're doing and the thinking that they need to think they need to get up at, you know, he had to get up at like five 30 to be at a school by like seven ten. I mean, yep. it was, it's just nuts. So to allow for that and to decrease the time span that the kids are actively and really actively not bored actively, yeah. <laughs> but really actively using their brains. Um, we know we can't actively use our brains in those processes you just outlined for six straight hours. We can't, yeah. that's not possible. It's not the way we work. It's not human beings. So that yeah. is perfect. Oh, it's very humane. It's very humane. And yeah, there's a full hour lunch between breaks. And um, I would say that our kids, right, they're, they come rested and ready to engage. Um, you know, I, I, you're right. There's only so many hours of really intense work I can do, and we'd rather have fewer hours of high quality work. And then, you know, people ask, is there homework? And I say, it depends on your child's goals. For our students who are doing two years of math per year, they're spending a lot of time in math space cranking through the math. For our students who are starting a business and trying to make money or writing a huge amount, they're writing novels to work. They are, but in some ways that's not working. They have assigned it to themselves. If they've decided this is what I'm going to do. Um, you know, I've had students who are producing a play and they spend all working weekend working on the play, you know, um, cool. That's, that's what they want to do. So it's this balance. I, I think that if we love, again, we love what we do, we do what we love, then we are more productive than if we're spending time bored, silly and uh, exhausted. Yeah, completely. Two things that just came to mind again, too. Um, all of your classes are online. So they're, they're communicating, they're seeing on Zoom. Do you have actual meetings in person? In addition to that? Great question. So first, the most exciting piece, last year, we took a trip trip to Greece, we're going to do another trip to Greece this year. Yeah, it was so delightful after getting so familiar with each other virtually to actually see each other in person, obviously only a subset. We're also planning an annual trip to Central America, probably Panama, and then a camping trip in the US. So three kind of school wide opportunities to get together. And then we have concentrations of students in New York, San Francisco, Southern Florida, Austin, San Antonio, those sorts of places, and Panama, and there people are getting it in person. Um, and then also in terms of community, it's still virtual, but we have a Slack channel where the kids can interact 24 seven. Of course, on their own, they created a Discord channel that we have no control over where they can go and do what they do. I'm always a little bit squeamish, what's going on over there, but we don't, yeah. but you know, and there have been one or two minor incidents, but the the teens who are leading it are pretty responsible. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're very connected. They're extremely connected. Wow. That's amazing. And then the second question that came up was, what about the parents? How much, I, mean, I remember, especially in elementary school, middle school, both of my sons were in music. They were in marching band. So I was very involved. I play music. So I was very involved in their school, both as a volunteer and as a music volunteer. So how, how can, how do parents get involved in this, uh, this educational process? Sure. Well, start with this younger parents. If we have a third grader, we don't do kindergarten grades one and two, because it's just not appropriate to be virtual. Right. Right. But even with a third grader, we we you know advise parents that they should be substantially involved when the children are in third, fourth grade. You know, some are more independent by fifth grade and so forth. So there's you know pretty high touch if a child is starting that young. Um, more broadly, we do have a few parents volunteering in various capacities to help us, and you know we've got parents doing various things. Certainly, parents were chaperones on the trip to Greece and will be chaperones on our other thing. So we welcome parent participation. And as you know, some parents are eager to be involved and helped and other parents are, you know, drop them off and let it go. So <laughs> full range. Wow. Wow. I, I just, yeah, this is so amazing. And especially with the advent of being so connected um, over the internet and allowing for people to be connected from anywhere in the world. Um, it really, why would we not have education take advantage of that and allow for exposure to these new ideas? Um, well, and if I could just talk about the around the world thing yeah. briefly, yeah. Um, we have students from Mexico, Honduras, Panama, Turkey, um, Pakistan, Iraq, 
Taiwan. We have guides from Eswatini, Guatemala, uh, Mexico, Turkey. So we're a dramatically international community. So we're super connected. Kid from Senegal, really international. Wow, that's incredible. And just the, you know, I don't care how um, integrated the United States is, or I won't say integrated, I guess uh, multicultural the United States is. But to actually speak to someone from another culture and have that person in your experience and have them in, in, in have them in your experience and you in their experience, that alone will make you more open to new ideas and new people than any amount of education on what you should believe from other cultures. <laughs> Right. Well, well, and just have a fun one. You know, we do have very politically diverse. So just within the U.S., we have, you know, very progressive San Francisco families, and they'll see the family in Alabama with a gun rack behind the kid at his computer, like ah. But that's how different we are. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that so much. I just love that so much because no matter what you think in your head about other people who might have a gun rack, you're going to really see. Uh, because you're going to participate with those people. And the same thing with the other way, the kid with the gun rack and looking at a San Francisco family. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. so good. That is so good. So, all right, thinking about this, I mean, I really would like to bring this down to ground level and help people try and uh, and and maybe use some of these tools to just start talking to their kids a little bit differently if they can. Mm -hmm. So is there is there any piece of advice you would give a parent who's listening to this conversation? And maybe they're obviously I'm going to ask them to to look at your your information and we can have that in the uh in the notes for this episode. But what would you advise for them to start getting trying to communicate with their child in a different way instead of just accepting whatever they're hearing at school and thinking they have to learn when the declaration of independence was signed and you know when this that or the other thing happened um and start actually open their child's mind to these kinds of conversations well, thank you. I think the first place to start is, again, start with the end in mind. Um, there's so much anxiety over college admissions. Uh, and first, any student can get into community college. Second, um, you know, there's a dip in college enrollment. Most colleges are def desperate for students. But finally, I want to talk about the Ivy League and the high end. Um, what people don't realize, and this actually will go back to why passion and personal projects and things are so important, is that one of the best ways, once you have the great SAT scores, I've talked about do that, doing how to do that, a few college courses, do well in a few college courses while in high school, but it doesn't need to be 15 APs. It can be, you know, three, four, just show your, you can do serious college work, um, do the SATs as we said. But then the other thing is amazing personal projects. So I'll give you a couple of anecdotes. Um, I have a mentee, Caleb Capocha, who got into Harvard, he was completely unschooled, so didn't do any regular school, um, took a few community college courses his junior, senior year, got into Harvard. Um, by the way, he was a professional actor who worked uh, alongside Pierce Brosnan for a couple of years. So what does Harvard care about? They care about interesting, amazing people. Uh, different case, um, Laura Deming, whose father is a friend of mine, famously got into MIT at 14, dropped out at 16 to accept a Teal Fellowship, and uh, is now in her 20s, one of the leading anti-aging VCs. I saw her, she again was basically no formal schooling. Um, she woke up every day and read for two hours, did two hours of math, and played the piano for two hours, but no traditional courses. Um, but she was very driven and passionate. I saw her transcript to get into MIT. It was a list of the books she'd read, it was a list of the uh, college STEM courses she'd audited, and she was working in the lab of a world-class researcher who wrote her a recommendation. And of course, that's what mattered. Um, when I went to Harvard, the kid with the lowest SAT scores in my class had been an elector of a small town in Michigan at the age of 18. You do that, Harvard doesn't care about your SAT scores. You know, and so I think we need to shift from all this anxiety around school and academic performance. Again, I'm a big learner, voracious learner, all about let's do well in the SAT and the academics. But I would say what parents are missing is who is your child? What do they love? How can I develop those interests? How can I support my child in exploring the things he or she loves? Have the expectation that they will and they can create a business, write a novel, you know, create a movie, whatever it is, I've got a kid who's creating a music video and it's hard. You know, a lot of teenagers love music videos. 
It's one thing to watch it, totally different to try to produce it. So encourage your child to do serious work, and especially around puberty. Say, you know, you're becoming a young adult in a traditional society, you'd be a young adult. I wanna see you do amazing things. I'm here to support you. And a lot of this is not finger wagging. That doesn't work with kids, but parents, uh, what, instead of finger wagging towards child children, parents need to tell their children, I love you and I want to help you become the most amazing person you can in whatever way is right for you. So I see our job as parents and educators is to help each child find their individual genius. I truly believe in a world of 8 billion geniuses, but some of them, you know, Robin Williams, one of the greatest comedians ever, he was a disaster in school. He was jumping on the desks under the table. You know, imagine as a teacher having Robin Williams in a class. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Richard Branson is a high school dropout. Richard Branson did okay. So I think a lot of this is I really encourage parents to have a far more diverse understanding of excellence and achievement and to support their child's true genius. And if school is in the way, so much the worse for school. I think one of the most um, damaging things in our society is this one size fits all. Actually, as somebody who's good at school, in some ways I have a bad conscience. People like me who were good at school are imposing it on others. It's the right path for some. For 20 to 30 percent, yeah, let's let's do the, the school thing, the regular school thing. But I think for 70 to 80, maybe 90 percent of our kids, there are better paths. So think about the diverse forms of genius that your child may have and help them discover and develop that, whatever it is. Uh, and don't be anxious about other things. If, if they are sufficiently amazing at who they are and what they do, paths will be open to them. Okay, hold on. If your mindset was shifted, you were inspired to innovate and you were spurred into action, don't just move on with your day. Focus, my friend, and take a few minutes to visit ceomischiefmaker.com to learn more about the value that was shared with you today. Please act now and create some CEO mischief of your own.